Hey everybody, this is Jeremy Siskin. I am the author of this book over here, entitled Playing Solo Jazz Piano. Um, and today I wanted to talk with you about uh, ways to get started or to get more advanced with your comping. So this is called Nine Levels of Jazz Piano Comp. Um, as many of you know, comping is this word that's short for accompanying or complementing, depending on who you ask. Um, and you want your comping to be completely spontaneous sounding and probably for the untrained ear, jazz piano comping sounds really random. Um, but when you're studying it, it doesn't really help to just try to play randomly. It does help to listen to the masters and to try to imitate pianists like Wynton Kelly or McCoy Tyner or Cedar Walton or Bill Evans uh, or Hank Jones, one of my favorite accompanists um, or, you know, Herbie Hancock. I'm, I could name a million other people. Um, but there are some, maybe we could say, shortcuts or some ways to get started um, in a more organized way. But before we dive into these nine tips, I just wanted to show you kind of how I think about comping. Comping for me is kind of the like merging of these three things. On one hand, we have chord, the chord symbols, right? The chords of the piece. Second thing is the style, right? I'm going to comp differently, whether I'm playing in a swing style, a bossa nova style, a samba style, a pop rock style, right? Those are all going to be individual. And for good pianists, for really good jazz pianists, they know even more than that. They're going to comp differently in a modal jazz style versus in kind of a real straight ahead swing style. They're going to comp differently maybe if they're trying to play something from kind of blue than they are from some, playing something from a Love Supreme versus playing something from the Oscar Peterson um, book. So style can be really, really specific to even as specific as you know an artist's particular style. And then the third thing, and for people maybe coming from a classical background, this is the hardest to understand, is that comping has to do with the musical moment. I'm gonna comp differently at the beginning of a solo than I am at the end of the solo. I'm gonna comp differently uh, if there's 10 soloists versus if there's one soloist. I'm going to maybe pace it a little bit differently. Um, I'm going to comp differently whether I'm playing with a guitar player or not, whether I'm playing in a big band or whether I'm playing, you know, in just a trio or a quartet setting, right? Um, so just before we get started, I'm just going to comp for you for a couple of choruses on the blues. It's very self-conscious and it's weird to comp uh, without a soloist, but that's kind of what we're doing right now. Um, and just to warn you, because some I've had students who are confused, my left hand is going to be imitating what the bass would be doing, and then my right hand is going to be doing the comping. And by the way, today I'm not going to be talking about voicings, what sorts of... Uh, notes you should be playing while you're comping. Um, I'll probably cover that in a future video and I also have some information about that in this book as well as a book called Jazz Band Pianist. Um, but I'm going to be talking more about how you decide what rhythms you're going to play, what sorts of articulation. So here's a couple choruses of the blues. <laughs> One, you want your top note to be melodic while comping. You want it, you know, obviously it's not making a beautiful melody that you would want some, uh, but it is, you know, a sort of a melody. It's not just kind of randomly leaping around. And relatedly, you want your comping to be in phrases if possible, um, not just kind of short stabs, but actually kind of creating a short musical stage. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, um, so let's dive in. Like I said, as you, you know, become a really good comper, uh, you want it to sound pretty unpredictable because you want to be in the moment, responding not only to the soloist, but to the drummer and the bass player and whoever else might be in the band. But in order to learn, you have to start somewhere. So I recommend starting with these three kind of essential comping patterns. 
Uh, the first one is called the Charleston. By the way, this is named after the James P. Johnson piece called the Charleston. It goes something like this. <laughs> swings hopefully <laughs> um, I want you to take notice of my articulation and volume um, I always say to my students that comping should be as loud and as long as a brush hitting the snare drum so if you can think of that sound ka, 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 ka. Um, later we're gonna talk about adding some long articulations but in general um, I find that beginning compers comp too long and too heavy um, and so I start all of my students, and I recommend for beginning pianists to start thinking all of them light disconnected, okay? You could call them staccato if you want. Um, second pattern is the reverse Charleston. This one's a little bit more chill. Um, you heard me using the Charleston with a bass line in four. Oftentimes pianists play the reverse Charleston with a bass line in two, meaning half notes. So. Charleston again. Um, I teach these two first. Um, and in fact, I have a two semester jazz piano class and I only teach these two with some variations the first semester. And so uh, before we get to the third, I would recommend practicing alternating, you know, maybe two bars Charleston, two bars reverse Charleston, one bar reverse Charleston, one bar Charleston, right? <laughs> because it's I think it's the most difficult one but it's really uh, important to a good jazz style I call it the red garland pattern named after the pianist from Miles Davis's first great quintet red garland um, who often would kind of just groove on this pattern I said that most jazz comping is unpredictable but when you listen to some of those first first quintet albums red garland is just playing this same pattern again and again and this pattern anticipates both of your strong beats in the measure right so those strong beats are one and three so this shifts it over and you come in on the end of two and the end of four. And I say this is the hardest because you don't have any downbeat to latch on to. So one, two, three, four. to push the music forward because like I said you're anticipating those two strong beats and anticipating is a really key concept um, in this comping so check it out I have the Charleston pattern here by the way if you're not familiar with this X notation this is what we use when we have rhythms but we don't necessarily want to include the notes um, so it would be pretty common that you have two chords like this the C major 7 and the F major 7 on beats 1 and 3 now, the Charleston comes in, like we said, on one and the end of two. And so when this happens, we're going to anticipate that F7 by an eighth note, and we're gonna come in um, with it here on the end of two. So we're gonna be playing that F7. So if I'm playing this measure, I would play one comp of C, and then one comp of F, even though that chord hasn't technically started yet. Like one, two, three, four, one, two, three. That's gonna start an eighth note early. Same thing, but only more to the extreme if we have this red garland pattern, because we're anticipating both strong beats. So here, I think of this first and of four as happening before beat one. So we're gonna play the C major seven that comes in on beat one on the end of four, and the F major seven that comes in on beat three on the end of two. So each are just coming in an eighth note earlier. So listen to this one, two, three, four. As we're comping, we always want to be an eighth note early. All right, the next thing that I would do 
is um, add some variations of this through what I call push-offs. Um, and push-offs are where you play the same chord two or even maybe more times in a row. And usually we're using this to end on an off beat. So instead of just playing on beat one, we're gonna play in jazz, we're trying constantly to make more phrases that finish on off beats because that's what's really going to drive the rhythm. Um, the articulation is really important here. So I'm trying to put zero, zero, zero space, zero daylight in between these two chords. And notice I'm snapping off and I'm putting an accent on the second one. Attention. One thing that you'll notice here is that I add grace notes to some of my chords here. And that, that's not particularly to push offs. I just wanted to throw that in there um, uh, that you can add grace notes to make your comping a little bit more expressive. So if we were going to add push offs to these patterns, here's the Charleston with its push offs. So you see the um, I've added this chord on the end of one in order to complete that push off with a Charleston. And it just adds a little bit of variation if I'm comping with a Charleston. A little variation. Same thing, I've added this note on the end of two to create a push off. Charleston here I added a note on the end of three to create a push off so instead of one two three four now we have this and on the red garland pattern we can add notes comps on beats two and four to create push multiple push offs one two three if you do it all the time, but look at if you just kind of pepper it in. It kind of creates the feeling of an accent. Now, what's complicated here is let's imagine that this measure was a C7 and then this measure was F major 7. We've already said, and I'm going to use blue here because I've already got a lot of colors going on, that the F major 7 would start here on the end of four because of that anticipation rule. And that means we're gonna comp one C7 and one F major seven. And that's often the case that we have to change chords between these two eighth notes of the push off when we're using it with the red garland rhythm. Sorry, I know it's cut off a little bit. So it'd be one C7 and then one F major seven. But what if we wanna get more creative and create even more motion? We can use these two techniques called tonicization and sidestep, okay? Um, so tonicization means whatever chord we have, we're going to add that chord's dominant five. So if we have a C major seven, you can see that this rhythm here, this is the Charleston with the push off, da, do, da, da, do, da. I'm gonna add in a G7 to this chord on beat two. So it's creating a five to one progression, right? It's making the C sound like a tonic. That's why we call it tonicization. So we add one, five, one. A sidestep means that we're going to move our chord by a half step, either up or down, and then return to the original chord. So for a side step, since we have a C major seven, we might use a D flat major seven or a B major seven. Pretty nice. So this is almost like an extreme version of a neighbor tone, right? A neighbor tone is when you just move a note a half step away. Here we're moving every note in the chord a half step away. And as you see here, it could either be up to D flat or it could go down to B.
Let me show you a different example using the Red Garland rhythm. So here we're using uh, two push-offs. Um, and what I wanted to show you here is that you want to lead in to the next chord, right? If, whether you're using tonicization or a sidestep. So here we're leading into the C major, so we're going to use G7. But then here we're leading in to the F major, so we're going to use C7. And same thing with the sidestep, you want to lead into the next chord. So that's from above, or it could be. By the way, these two devices, tonicization and sidestep, um, could be used not just once, but multiple times. So I'll show you in an isolated kind of scenario. So uh, let's pretend that I'm, I'm playing like a simple funk tune. I'm going to play a C7 with a flat 9. Okay. So that's a sidestep. I'm moving each of the notes down a half step. Watch what I'm about to do now. We call it a double sidestep. That was a triple sidestep, I think. One, two, three, and down. Right, you could use that sidestep multiple times. And that's true if I'm playing a blues as well, although. You know, you have a shorter amount of time in a blues to make a sidestep. Um, so if I... Right, I could do... I can do these same tricks, but multiple times. Okay. All right, number four... Um, is a shorter one with a much less technical explanation. Um, and this is really two and one. Um, but, you know, my next step usually for comping after we're getting good at these three patterns, the tonicization, the side steps, the push offs, is to talk about varying articulation. So um, originally, I'd start with everything short. Here's a Charleston, all short. But a really nice, easy way to vary it is. pattern you can create really a bit a feeling of getting bigger and growing in energy if you hold all the, the chords check this out space and not play every other every measure you could maybe do just one of the two comps from your pattern in the measure so instead of playing both on beat one and the end of two with the charleston you could play um right so i'm playing on one in the end of two and then skipping one and playing on the end of two <coughs> excuse me or with the reverse charleston feeling of you know randomness or a variety um, and so I would practice and you could also leave out whole measures you don't have to play every measure and by the way and I have students who really struggle with this you truly don't have to play every chord that's written your chart is giving you information and you are allowed to do whatever you want with that information you can even choose as you're comping to sit out for someone's entire solo the best pianists do that all the time um, so it could be
you learn, but I'm leaving some measures wide open. Okay. So uh, even though it seems simple, it's worth practicing really consciously, varying your articulation and leaving space in your column. All right, number five, my, my technology might fail me here, but um, is moving the Charleston and reverse Charleston to the second half of the measure. Let me see if it's gonna let me do this. Um, not quite. I'll hold it right here so you can see it. So um, instead of starting the Charleston on beat one, we could start it on beat three. And instead of starting the reverse Charleston on the end of one, we could start it on the end of three. So instead of... <laughs> Charleston but starting on beat three or we could try the reverse Charleston starting on the end of three so that gives you even more comping patterns using these patterns that now you're really familiar with by the way sometimes we do you might be wondering what about beat two or beat four it doesn't seem as common doesn't seem as natural to me but there is this pattern called the sidewinder which is the Charleston um, starting on beat two, and this is named after a great Lee Morgan tune. Um, you may not have to let this go, you're not going to see it anymore, but your comps here, since it's starting on beat two, would be on two and the end of three. It's not really great for swing. Um, that piece is kind of like a Latin y go go something. Um, it's, you know, a particular groove, but it's just a nice one to know about. Moving on to our next page. Um, and these next few items have to do with um, having your left hand and right hand interacting as you're comping. Um, so now I'm going to not be the bass player anymore, I'm going to be a soloist. And it's really important to practice call and response. Call and response is just an essential part of the jazz tradition. Um, and you know, as you're getting started playing your right hand, with, uh, improvising in the right hand and comping in the left, um, one of the best ways to start is thinking about call and response. Um, I have these exercises that are very basic called play two, rest two, play one, rest one. Um, I'll demonstrate play two, rest two. one you could probably figure out what it sounds like but just in case so in these call and response exercises at least at the beginning the hands will never be together um, but you know you can accompany um, I sometimes think of it as having two levels of comping, one that's really not meant to be heard, and then one that's meant to be like the trombone section of big band playing, you know, these uh, respondents, response figures. So... And so I'll play them at kind of two different intensity and volume levels whether I want it to just kind of be in the background or whether I want it to stick out and be heard. Um, so it's fun to combine different um, patterns of play two, rest two, play one, rest one. For example, I could do the first four measures of the blues as play two, rest two, and the next four as play one, rest one, and the last four as play two, rest two. So. of that would be the, what I call locked hands comping. This is a style I associate strongly with Bill Evans and basically this means that you're going to um, play whatever rhythm you're playing in your right hand, in your left hand as well, even if it's fast. 
Um, and some pianists struggle technically to repeat the chords as fast as they'd like. Um, that's something to work off to, towards. Um, so if I'm playing... sure as you do that that you match the exact articulation and the length that you're doing in the right hand in the left if you're kind of playing the left you know really short while your right hand's playing long it's not really going to have the desired effect of making it sound like kind of it's all one thing playing together by the way this is what we do if you are playing a shout chorus you know if we're playing a shout chorus um, we might just simply play melody and octaves in the right hand and then play locked hand style comping in the left note of the octave. Or you could add more notes. Right, so that locked hand comping is a really great skill to have and um, it's a nice thing to be able to use in the third, fourth, or fifth chorus of your solo when you need a little bit more variety. Kind of Locked hand comping light is what I call accentuating uh, right hand notes. And um, here I have to make this a little bit small, but in this style, I basically choose some notes, maybe the first note of your phrase, the last note of your phrase, and some notes that kind of stick out maybe in the texture. Um, and I would plan your left hand comping to go with those right hand notes. There's the example I wrote up. Uh, one, two, three, four. hand comps with the, you know, uh, important accented right hand notes. So in, in a lot of ways, this is the opposite of just really relying on a comping pattern. Instead of having just a consistent thing going on in the left hand, no matter what your right hand's doing, um, you can have your left hand actually working with the right. if you're playing a style like bebop. And then my last tip for you for today um, is to add some low bass accents. Um, when I hear a lot of my pian my favorite pianists playing from McCoy Tyner, Oscar Peterson, their left hand isn't always staying in that middle register. They're often going down to the lower range and it's usually a fifth, maybe sometimes a seventh that they're playing. Um, and I imagine it as being like the bass drum of their drum set. If, you know, we're mostly comping along with a snare drum in the middle register. We can also add some bass drum hits. So. You know, in the bebop style, Max Roach talks about dropping bombs as being such an important part of the bebop style. Um, and of course, that's you know mainly, I guess, uh, for drummers. But as pianists, we can drop bombs like Max Roach or Kenny Clark um, as well. So um, this book is my baby. I really appreciate it when people buy it, especially directly from my website, jeremysiskin.com. 
Um, thank you for sticking with me for nearly a half hour. And uh, please like, subscribe, comment. It makes me feel good. And it's just making me so, so rich. So thank you very much. Take care.